Hello, everyone. Welcome to the series Mud Talks, Unwinding the Mystery of Coiling Cucumber Tendrils with Professor Sharon Gerbodi. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending today's event. This talk is being recorded and will be distributed after the event. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon to kick it off. Sharon, thanks for being here today. The floor is yours. Thanks, Thank Vanessa. Hi, everyone. I'm Sharon Gerbodi. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a physicist who likes plants. So let me see if I can share screen. Hopefully, you can now see a slide. Um, so yes, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted to chat with you all today about some of the biophysics stuff I've had fun thinking about over the years. So mostly I'm going to share out some work that I did before I came to Harvey Mudd when I was still at um, Harvard during my postdoc. But then with time permitting, I'm hoping to also add on a little bit about more current work that's going on in our lab this summer. Um, so the video that you see below shows a cucumber plant. To be honest, it's actually called wild cucumber. It is a cousin of the regular cucumber plant, the one that creates delicious food. Um, and what you can see are that it has these tendrils, these long, thin appendages that it's moving around. Now, this is not real time. All the movies that I'm showing you in this talk are sped up by a factor of about 5,000, which is sort of hard to wrap your head around. Um, the way I like to think about it is that about one time that one of these appendages goes around in a circle as it's sort of whipping around searching for something to grab onto, that's about 45 minutes. So what are these appendages doing? These cucumber tendrils have learned how to climb up on top of other plants to gain an advantage and access to sunlight without having to put in a lot of energy to grow thick, strong trunks to support themselves. But before we go any further, I wanted to share with you a couple of other interesting little vignettes about plants. Um, so certainly on the left-hand side, you'll recognize the Venus flytrap plant, which is notorious for digesting uh, flies and other insects. Um, the person that I did my postdoc with, El Mahadevan at Harvard, uh, one of the papers that got me interested in working in his group was a paper where they studied the mechanics of how these Venus fly traps snap shut, trapping the poor fly inside. Um, on the top right, you can see mimosa. This is the touch sensitive plant that closes up its little leaflets to protect itself when some sort of animal bumps into it. Um, and on the bottom right is actually a seed. And I want to take a moment to actually navigate to a video that I have for you about this remarkable seed. Um, so this is called Storksbill seed. It's a relative of geranium. First of all, the way these seeds get flung off the plant in a catapulting motion is itself an interesting mechanic story. But what I wanted to show you now is the remarkable way in which these seeds continue to move and to actually do useful work after they are separated from the plant. So at the bottom, I hope you can see my pointer here, at the bottom is the actual seed that has all the genetic material and everything needed to start growing a new plant. And then this long tail thing that if you look closely, you can tell it's twisted up. That's called the on. And that part is completely dead cells, okay? So these cells have long ago died. They're just dried up cell walls. Um, and it's shaped in this interesting corkscrew shape. So I, I'm emphasizing that the cells are dead because in a moment, you're gonna see that even though this tissue is dead and there are no muscles, there's no brain to control the motion of the tissue, it does in fact move. Um, and how it does it is really quite remarkable. So these storksbill seeds um, harness the ambient energy sources in the environment. So in this case, it's harvesting the energy that comes from humidity cycles. So when humidity is increased, water gets absorbed by the cells in that long tail, the on, 
And as the water gets absorbed into it, it untwists into a straighter tail shape. Then in the heat of daytime, it winds up again. And you might have already noticed that as it does this, it's actually driving the seed into the earth. Now these seeds won't germinate properly unless they're actually in the earth by some amount, okay? And here's another one. You may have also noticed that there are little hairs sticking off of the sides of both the seed and the on itself. And because those are angled in a certain direction, um, it doesn't just reverse the motion, right? So during the winding, you might think that the seed would reverse back out of the soil. I'll just let that play one more time because it's so cool. Um, but these, these hairs along the side of it ensure that when it's winding up again, that it doesn't slip back out. So there's an asymmetric coefficient of friction that's aiding this uh, the seed to go into the earth and not come back out again. When I first saw this, it absolutely blew my mind that these things can literally drill themselves into the earth to ensure that they can germinate properly and that they do so without muscles, without any central nervous system to control the action, but it all happens passively by just absorbing and emitting water. Um, so everything has to be pre-programmed into the architecture of the tissue. Um, and so I, this is already fascinating as far as I'm concerned, but it's also useful for doing, whoops, let me get to this one. Uh, one of the things that we can do by studying the way these tissues that are sort of pre-patterned and designed in a way to actuate and have different kinds of motion, one way we can make use of what we learn is in the sort of nascent field of soft robotics. Um, so this is a, a video from NASA talking about how soft robotics are being developed for moon exploration and perhaps exploration on Mars. But essentially these are robots um, that are, and I'll, I'll back up again so you can get a look at the first part that I think is most interesting. So these are sort of a fusion of sort of traditional robots that are made of rigid materials like metals and so on with these very flexible compliant materials. What you're looking at here is a silicone mold. So that's the same thing that like your silicone spatula that you use when you're scraping batter out of a bowl, that same kind of material, but it's been patterned in a particular way with structure on the inside of it. In this case, there are little air pockets that can fill up with air. The tubes that you see are pumping air into or sucking air out of those pockets, um, resulting in change of shape and motion of these soft parts. This is actually a little soft robot that can crawl along a surface and it can also grasp things. And if you'll allow me to just show you one more, if I can find it. Um, so again, this is a soft material with a bunch of little pockets that can be inflated or deflated to get bending motion or to get twisting motion or um, as you'll see, if we have time to talk about our morning glory work that our lab is doing now, sometimes you can get a combination of both bending and twisting. So in part, we study the shape change and motion that's actuated in plant tissues as a source of inspiration for designing new kinds of soft robotic materials, but also because uh, there's a lot of inspiration to be gained from observing how these plant tissues not only actuate these motions efficiently, but how they can do so by harnessing ambient energy sources, which could be very useful if we want to develop new alternative sources of energy. Um, but also plants are just cool. So let's see, coming back to cucumber tendrils. So I already mentioned there are these long, thin appendages, and you can see that first they sort of whip around searching for something to grab onto. And again, one sort of period of oscillation here is about 45 minutes. Um, so it's slow enough that you don't notice it while it's happening, but if you walk away and then look back again, you sure notice that it has moved. I'll play that one more time. So the tendril unfurls, it's basically long and straight and it whips around looking for something to grab onto. 
And if it finds something that activates this grasping motion where it will firmly attach to whatever it is that they grab onto. Now, it's, it's a great race out there for plants to try to gain access to sunlight and maximize the resources that they can make use of with while minimizing the amount of sort of energy and resources they need to expend in order to grow. And tendril bearing plants are great if they produce delicious cucumbers, but most of the time they're weeds because they've figured out a way to sort of cheat the system by climbing on other objects. So this is um, a movie where we can see there's one tendril at the bottom here that had already grabbed on. So if you're a plant and you've got a tendril whipping around grabbing onto something, just grabbing onto it is not going to lift you up. So the plant not only needs to attach to other things, but it needs to pull itself upward. And the way that it does that is that the tendrils overall arc length, so the actual length that an ant would measure as it walks along the full length of the tendril, that's fixed. It doesn't shrink that. But while keeping one end fixed on a support, the other end is fixed at the plant, it can coil that tendril into a helical sort of corkscrew-like shape. And as it does so, the axial length so the length between the plant and the thing that it has grabbed is shrinking, even though the overall arc length of the tendril has not changed. Um, so this is a great place to pause and say, many people have studied this problem before, most famously Darwin here. And he was actually the first to recognize an interesting geometrical requirement. So if you have a tendril, and I guess I've got one over here, so, I don't know to what extent this is visible, but if, if you have a tendril, this is one I took from a plant at the Los Angeles Arboretum, it always has a right-handed helix on one side and a left-handed helix on the other side. And the place where the two connect, it switches handedness from right-handed to left-handed, and Darwin was the one to figure out that this was actually a geometric requirement because the thing starts out untwisted. One end is clamped at the plant. The other end is clamped at wherever it grabbed onto. And so now, since it's untwisted and neither side is allowed to twist relative to the other, the only way for it to get corkscrews is to have the same number of right handed turns as it does left-handed turns, or at least very close to the same number, um, right? So for every time it goes around clockwise, it has to undo that later by going counterclockwise. Now in the era when Darwin was looking at these things, uh, he, <laughs> he decided to call this place where the two, uh, where the two right-handed and left-handed helices connect. He called this a helical perversion, which is just like such a Victorian English way of saying something. So unfortunately, the term perversion has persisted as a way to describe the place where these two different helices meet. So apologies for that word. Um, so at the time when the group that I was in, oops, I forgot to introduce them. So this is Maha, that's me. This is Josh. Pusey, and this is and Andy McCormick. So this is El Mahadevan, goes by Maha. He's at Harvard. Um, when we started working on this, we had just gotten a new clue about the fact that if you look at the cross section of one of these tendrils, there was a very clear marker of these special kinds of cells. Um, and without explaining everything that's on this slide, I'll just uh, quickly share that these kinds of cells are also present in hardwood trees like oaks, and they're responsible for holding the branches up instead of letting them flop down due to the weight of all, you know, the mass of the leaves and everything else that's on the branch. So these cells have a quite incredible ability to shrink lengthwise or expand lengthwise. Um, and these scientists had just figured out that those kinds of cells are present in cucumber tendrils. So that was a great starting point for our team. 
our plant biologist, Josh Pusey, who's now a faculty member at William & Mary, um, he was able to slice and dice some cucumber tendrils. So at the top here, you can see a cucumber tendril before it has coiled. You see here a just regular light microscope image of what the cross section looks like. And this black box here is showing that when we stain for those special gelatinous fiber cells, um, that we don't see any when it's uncoiled. Okay, so no special cells in the tendril before it coils. But now if we take a cross section of a tendril after it has coiled, we see now with this special stain that the cells in a certain region light up. And those are the cells um, that have been known to shrink lengthwise or expand lengthwise. And when we zoom in even closer, we can see that this narrow strip is really just about two cell layers thick. Okay, we're looking at a cross section. So it's a very thin strip in cross section, but lengthwise it's very long. So it's basically like a long ribbon that runs in the interior of the tissue of the tendril. Um, and Josh Pusey, being a biology genius, found a way to basically dissolve away all the rest of the tissue, all the green stuff, and extract from the inside just this super thin strip of cells. So just the ribbon. And lo and behold, when he did that, and we look at it, it's beautifully iridescent. I have artwork in my office of some microscope images that we collected of this. If I zoom in, what you're seeing is a super thin two cell layer thick ribbon. And your eye, I'm sure, is clearly picking out these sort of stripes along the ribbon. And those are individual, extremely long cells, okay? And so these long cells are collected together into a ribbon that has that coiled tendril shape. And it was an interesting clue that there were just two layers of cells stuck together. And we started to think about bilayer systems. So we started to think about, well, what if we had one strip of cells that were to shrink lengthwise and another strip of cells stuck to it that didn't shrink? That seems like that could cause some curvature. So we started to explore that. So on the bottom left here, we have sort of a cartoon of two layers of cells, the red layer on the bottom and the blue layer on the top. By the way, you might notice the sort of celery shape of this material. That's because um, the, the fiber ribbon already has this natural curvature in its cross section, which it turns out doesn't influence the coiling. But so we included that shape here. So you might notice that sort of celery shape. That ended up not being important for the coiling. The important part was that the uh, one layer of cells depicted in red here does shrink lengthwise quite dramatically, while the other layer of cells depicted here in light blue does not. And so when that happens, it coils up because now the interior of the helix has less arc length than the exterior of the helix. And that can cause precisely the kind of shape change that we observe in the plant. So at this point, I started uh, having fun stretching pieces of rubber and putting glue on them to try and actually build a physical, visceral, in my hands model of how this motion might happen. So we started with a silicone rubber strip and then pulled it lengthwise, stretched it until it was strained to whatever length we wanted and then held it clamped like that. And then we added a second layer of rubber. Actually, we just uh, applied a layer of silicone caulk, the same stuff that you use to like, you know, fix holes <laughs> along the edge of your bathtub. So we spread a layer of silicone caulk and tried to keep it uh, as even as possible and allowed that to cure. And so what we've done by doing that is the bottom red layer is elongated and it wants to shrink back to its rest length. Whereas the top blue or white layer is very happy to be long, okay? And so if we release 
tension on the ends of the ribbon, you're going to get some curvature. And the actual amount of curvature that you get depends on various things like the thickness of the two layers, their relative stiffnesses, and so on. But let me see if I can open up a video. I hope that you can all see this. So we actually made, um, we made a little model of this. And lo and behold, if we clamp it at both ends and then allow those ends to come together, it does indeed coil up into the characteristic two helices connected by a perversion. Um, I also have one of these in my hands right now. I'm not sure whether or not you all can see uh, clearly, but here I have one of these devices right now. So the orangey side is the rubber, the white side. So the orangey side is the rubber, the silicone rubber that gets stretched. The white side is the silicone caulk that has hardened into rubber that likes to be long. And if I start with one of these that's straight and untwisted and allow it to relax, you can see the two helices forming. Now this webinar format uh, makes it difficult for me to know whether or not there are questions, but I bet there are questions out there. I don't know how to address them. Okay, no open questions and question and answer. So maybe we're all right. Um, feel free to let me know when you do have questions. Okay, so maybe I have a question for you to think about. Imagine that after this thing, uh, again, I'm, I'm showing you uh, on my actual video screen of me. So if I take this thing and allow it to shrink lengthwise by forming these helices. Now, if I pull it, what's it gonna do? And I'm sure you're thinking the same thing that I was thinking, which is, well, it's obvious. It's just going to unwind and go back to being flat again, right? So it's just like if I play this movie backward, if we pull it, sure enough, the thing unwinds and it returns to its initial flat, untwisted shape. Well, that makes perfect sense. I mean, that's how it formed in the first place. But check this out. I do yes. have uh, two questions for you. Okay, great. Uh, first one, do the plants sense when they have grabbed onto something before pulling? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, using some complicated biochemical signaling. So there are special touch-sensitive cells right at the tip, um, like from the tip, I don't know, basically near the tip of the tendril, extending all the way to the tip. And when it grasps onto something and those cells get activated, it triggers a little biochemical signal that causes it to very quickly coil, but just at the tip to grasp on. Um, I can't remember more details about that biochemical signal, but that has been studied quite a bit before. Great, thank you. And then how does the strip decide which direction to buckle, like forward or backwards, and does it go the same way every time? I wonder who asked that question. Um, yeah, it's such a it's such a wonderful uh, example of spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? So when the thing is flat like this, there's no difference between coiling as this one is sort of toward you versus it could have just as well coiled back that way. Um, so when I actually make one of these out of rubber, the first time we do it, it's really 50-50 probability that it will go one way or the other. Now, once it's done it a few times, there's some plastic deformation, which just means like permanent alteration of the material in this area. So now this guy is never going to go the other way anymore. But the first time, you're totally right. It's uh, symmetric. So there is nothing determining which way it goes. Great. And then last question, what is the mechanism in the plant that makes this happen? Is it movement of water? Yeah. Um, it is movement of water, but it's also a process known as lignification, um, where a material called lignin, this is where I wish Josh Pusey was next to me and I could say help with the biology, um, but I, this material called lignin enters into those cells. So the water flow is what causes the cells to change shape. So in this case, to shrink lengthwise, but then 
after that shrinking has happened, it then gets infused with this lignin stuff, which makes it very, very stiff and helps it hold in that coiled shape. Um, Vanessa, is that it for now? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm going to skip the movie and just show you the result. So if you actually take one of these fiber ribbons, so remember, that's like the, the two cell thick layer, um, two cell layer thick ribbon from inside the tendril. If you take one of these things, okay, so here it is before on the left, I am counting how many rotations there are, how many turns of the helix there are. So this one, the way I've clamped it here, has five turns on the left-hand side and seven turns on the right-hand side. And then as we pull it, instead of unwinding, as it should do, as any sensible you know, bit of rubber that you created would do, this one right here will do it, it doesn't unwind. This thing winds up even further. You pull on it more and it adds one whole turn on the left side and one whole turn on the right side. Okay, this absolutely flabbergasted me. Uh, you pull this thing, you know how it was, how it formed that shape. But now when you pull on it, instead of just going back to being flat, it winds up even further. Um, and not only the fiber ribbon from inside, but it turns out that actually as the tendrils age and get harder and more lignified over time, they also start to have this behavior. So this is an image of uh, not just the fiber ribbon from inside, but an entire tendril that when you pull on it, it adds extra turns on the other side as well. But the younger cucumber tendrils, they do just unwind. So what is going on? Uh, what causes this? And apparently this is um, a known phenomenon that happens also in DNA where it's called overwinding. So we went and read a bunch about overwinding and asked lots of questions. And frankly, we were stumped for three months, which is a long time during a postdoc. Um, and finally, I went to a fabric store down the street and you can go ahead and ignore that video for now. But I went to a fabric store down the street and I thought about the fact that the cells on that inner layer, the ones that shrink lengthwise to cause this shape change, they also lignify, which means they get very, very stiff, okay? And so that means that the inside of the helix, once it has coiled, so that's the, the shorter side, the interior, has a shorter length than the exterior, that interior does not want to get stretched out again, okay? It loses its flexibility. It becomes very stiff. It does not want to bend at all. And so I went ahead and painstakingly glued something to the interior of the already coiled rubber model. I have the actual model here. So in the inside of it, I glued just like a fabric ribbon. I went to the fabric store, got a white ribbon that someone might use to decorate, I don't know, something, <laughs> um, and glued it to the inside because this ribbon doesn't want to stretch, right? And in order to unwind what has to happen, that inner layer that shrank, it would need to extend again in order to unwind. So if you'll watch this video as I play it, so it starts out like that, and lo and behold, as we pull it, it actually winds up further, adding more turns on either side. Do you see that? I'll do it, run through it one more time. So it starts like this, and as I pull it, it winds up even more. And this, was a very exciting moment. This was one of the like, you know, you, you watch movies about scientists and how they have aha moments, right? And how exciting it is. This, this was like my one really big aha moment. It was extremely exciting. So yes, we managed to, you know, make an actual physical model that had this behavior, right? So here we see five turns on the left, four turns on the right. And then afterwards, six turns on the left and five turns on the right. So we actually were able to physically recreate this overwinding. So now, why does it work? So in order to wrap our heads around that, 
Um, I mean, I'll give you the short answer. The short answer is, and maybe you already have a sense of this from what I said earlier, but when the material, when the tissue lignifies, it becomes very resistant to bending. So it has a very high bending stiffness, which I will call big B in these slides. Um, whereas it's still pretty easy to twist. Okay, so twisting stiffness is C, bending stiffness is B. And I've got a diagram here for you uh, of a helix. So you can quantify the shape of a helix by knowing uh, a pair of parameters called R. This is the radius of the helix. So if we imagine the helix as being like a wire wound around a cylinder, this would be the radius of that cylinder that you're winding it around. That's what little r means. And P, called the pitch, is the distance between adjacent turns in the helix. Okay, so depending on the angle, the winding angle, uh, the pitch can be very small or it can be very large. Okay? Um, and so this helix, if you know its radius and its pitch, then it has a characteristic curvature and a characteristic amount of twist. And if we now think about starting with this yellow helix down here, so I'm gonna take you step-by-step step from left to right. So from now, just take a look at this yellow helix. It has six turns to begin with. And the curvature, looking over here on the right at this top equation, this curvature is related to both the radius and the pitch, okay? And it turns out that there is a way to stretch and elongate this original helix into a longer shape in such a way that the curvature remains unchanged. But I can also give you a visual representation of this. Um, so before I do that, let me just tell you what each of these three images is. So again, the one on the left, the yellow one is, you know, let's imagine our original helix before we pull on it to elongate it. The blue one in the middle shows what would happen if it was very easy to bend the material, but difficult to twist it. In that case, it's just like, I've got a slinky here. If we just grab this slinky and without allowing it to twist, just extend it like that, right? Just stretch it open. That's what's happening in the blue one. So we're not twisting it at all. We're not changing the number of turns. We're just stretching it out, okay? And in the purple case, we're not only stretching it out, but we're also allowing one end to twist so that we're adding additional turns as we extend it. And what's interesting is that the curvature, if we look at the yellow helix and the purple helix, they look pretty different from one another. But if we observe their curvature, it's actually identical. So the easiest way I know of to help explain this is to imagine a circle shown here. Um, and now we'll sort of squeeze this circle until we find the right size so that if we tilt it and put it in, this is three-dimensional now, we've tilted that circle down and nestled it into the helix so that it's tangent to the curve of the helix. We find the radius of the circle that best fits that yellow helix. That defines our curvature for us. So if we now take that same circle and try and match it up with our blue helix, the one where we don't add additional turns, but just stretch it, we can see that it doesn't match up. But if we then slide it over to the purple helix, where both the radius and the pitch have changed in such a way as to keep this curvature the same, we see that same circle still matches, okay? And so if I take this slinky that I'm playing with here, and if I try to elongate it, it's actually extremely difficult to elongate because this slinky is made in such a way that its bending stiffness, like the cucumber tendril, is much higher than its twisting stiffness. So it's actually really hard for me to stretch the slinky more than about this much. But if I additionally add more turns to it, as I pull, I can make it much, whoa, <laughs> I can make it, much, much, much longer. And we'll see if I can get a good grip. So now I can actually make it so long it's way out of the field of view of what you can see. Okay, so the takeaway here, folks, is by adding additional turns, it's possible to make the helix longer without changing its curvature. 
However, it's at a cost. It's at a cost of more twisting. But if you have a material that prefers twisting to bending, then this purple one is what's going to happen with pitch and radius changing at the same time to maintain a constant curvature. So why can that happen in the tendrils? That comes back to having this helical perversion, as Darwin called it. So by having this helical perversion, it's essentially like having a free end. So like this end on the, I don't know what you see, is that <laughs> left for you? And then this end for the other one, those are both free to twist around because of that perversion, right? It's not like being clamped and stretched like this. The presence of the perversion actually changes the mechanism. Um, and for the one that actually does overwinding, it allows it to wind up even further as you pull it. Okay, so once we understood that it had to do with the bending and twisting stiffnesses, we teamed up with Andy McCormick, who was able to run some simulations. So the top one, is a helix with a low bending stiffness and you can see that as it's pulled it just unwinds whereas the bottom one is for one with a high bending stiffness and you can see that it overwinds it adds even more turns okay but i looked at these things and i thought it looks like a spring i wonder what kind of spring it is and i wonder how the presence of this perversion that allows one end to twist freely on each of the two helices, I wonder how that changes what kind of spring it is. So maybe I should pause here and see if there are any questions before I go on to talking about the mechanics of these tendrils, because they're not just a way to pull the plant up onto a tree or a structure or something like that, but they're also a way to stay rigidly connected to that structure, right? To have a springy attachment. Um, so potentially the mechanics of these tendrils as sort of springs could be important for uh, the well-being of the plant. So far, no questions, but this is super cool to those listening in. Okay, great. Um, wonderful. So then let's see. Oh, sorry, Sharon. Um, during the initial coiling, how does the inner layer shrink while the outer layer does it? Yeah, great question. So those gelatinous fiber cells, the ones where we got the new clue from the paper that was published just before ours, um, those activated cells are on the inner layer only. And there's a different type of activated cells that are on the other side. So the inner layer activates in a shrinking way that the outer layer doesn't. And then it's also the inner layer that lignifies more. So that's how you get that differential elongation or shrinkage, really, to get the curvature. Are there other questions? Nope, we're good right now. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so we built a little, you can see there's like a little cantilever force measuring device here. And then we've got a little bit of tendril. I don't know if you can see that, it's a bit dim. And we essentially are able to stretch the tendril and measure the amount of force required by looking at the deflection of that cantilever, um, which affects the resistivity of the force measuring device. And so we can essentially measure a voltage to see how much force there is as we're pulling on it. So we have this strain gauge force sensor. We've got a movable stage at the other end controlled by a stepper motor. So we know how far we've extended it. And then uh, each tendril gets tested twice. So first we look at the whole tendril down here, which includes that helical perversion in the middle. And we take that tendril and we test it to see what its force extension behavior looks like when it has the helical perversion. And then we also looked at what happens if both ends are clamped and there's no helical perversion in the middle, allowing it to twist as it goes. Um, this next slide is a lot, but I'm just gonna highlight the important part. So let's take a look down here. The big, the big plot is from simulations. The small plot is from experiments. The vertical axis on both of these is the difference in force needed when there is a helical perversion 
relative to when there is not. So when this is negative, it means that the helical perversion makes it softer, less force is needed. And when it's above zero, when it's positive, that indicates that the presence of the helical perversion means that more force is required to pull it so that it's even stiffer. Okay, I'll now have you look up here at the experimental data. So the blue are the um, the blue are the tendrils that have the overwinding behavior. And what you see is that for those uh, for those tendrils, first, the presence of the helical perversion makes the spring softer and more compliant as this blue curve dips below the dotted line, but then quickly it goes the other way, making the spring much, much stiffer than it would have been otherwise. Whereas for the young uh, tendrils that don't overwind, the presence of the helical perversion just always makes it softer. Um, and so if we think about this and, you know, biologists who are out there listening right now, uh, watch out because I'm going to make a wild, this is not a real claim, but just a thought that I can ponder as a physicist. I wonder whether that could be useful for a plant, right? I could imagine that if you're connected by all these springs to something that you're climbing up, if there are small extensions, an animal brushes the plant as it walks by. It would be nice to have some flexibility there, but if something really serious happens, you want that spring to be very strong, be a very firm attachment point to ensure that you don't lose your grasp of the thing that you're climbing on. Okay, but take that with a huge grain of salt. I have done no study of how this affects like fitness of the plant or anything like that. Um, so because I was at Harvard at the time when we figured this out, um, and folks like to patent everything at Harvard, we ended up patenting uh, this, this spring based on a cucumber tendril that has this really interesting nonlinear behavior. Um, so happy to chat more about that if you have questions, but I'm gonna try and squeeze in like three minutes on the Morning Glory project that some students are working on right now in my lab this summer. Um, so this is a Morning Glory flower. First of all, Morning Glory plants do this beautiful twining to grow up along structures. That's also really awesome, but it's something that's been studied and I was looking at it too, but in my time-lapse videos, I noticed this. I noticed the way that the Morning Glory flowers bloom. I'm going to back it up so I can talk you through it. So it starts out with five, uh, they're called ribs, five pieces of the flower are wrapped around the petals, keeping them safe in the bud. And as the flower blooms, those five pieces unwind and unfurl, sort of like an umbrella, supporting this really soft, floppy, the blue part. It's called lamina. It's sort of the thing that I would think of as the petal. Okay, so you see these five ribs, we call them. Those are rigid. They give it structural stability. And morning glories are called morning glories because they open up in the morning, and then they do this in the afternoon. They close again. Um, but you may have already noticed that it doesn't just twist close the way it twisted open, right? So as this morning glory flower unfurls and blooms in the morning, it does so with this untwisting motion, right? And then it's open during the day. And then as it dries up and dies in the afternoon, instead of twisting closed again and just reversing the same process, it instead uses a different sort of motion where each of the ribs rolls closed. And as a result of doing this, um, the pistil and maybe the stamens also remain exposed. Whereas if it had twisted closed, they would have been completely enclosed inside the flopped over petals. And I'm just fascinated and have worked over the years with the same plant biologist, Josh Pusey on this, fascinated by how these ribs can actuate those two different kinds of motion, the untwisting and then the rolling closed. So just really quickly, um, a little bit of anatomy for you. So again, the sort of blue petally part is called the lamina. It's very soft 
and floppy, and it just kind of comes along for the ride. And all the interesting motion is caused by these five rigid ribs, which start out twisted in the bud, then sort of straighten out when it's completely unfurled in its open state, and then roll closed at the end. So each rib is like a long, skinny triangle. And if we look at one rib, it's actually made up of three distinct regions. You can kind of tell in this image up here. There are these two sort of thicker parts along the edges, which we call subribs, and then a flatter region that connects the two that we call the midrib. And so just super quickly, uh, the rolling closed mechanism, we quickly discovered that if we cut off all the lamina, it still rolls closed just the same. And we've ruled out a few different possibilities for the rolling closed mechanism. And the answer seems to be that the midrib, as it dries up, shrinks lengthwise, but the subribs remain hydrated. They don't dry up as much. And so we were able to mimic this with a piece of rubber by adding, uh, by taking a stretched piece of rubber and gluing onto the edges two other pieces of rubber that were not stretched. And so as we let this relax, it rolls up just like each of the ribs rolls up. And then this summer, we've been working on the twisting open mechanism of an ENA and Lizzie Rogers have been working on this. This is them in the lab earlier today working on it. Um, so we had discovered earlier, so this is like a model of a single rib. These sort of rubber rods on the sides are like the sub ribs and this triangular bit of rubber is the mid rib. And if these two rods are twisted first before we glue them to the central piece of rubber, then when we let go, the whole thing twists together. Um, but in the plant, the way this seems to happen, as we've seen through microscope images, is that the cells, when they're in the bud, are very, very twisted, and that's because of these rigid cellulose fibers that wrap around each cell. So this summer, Evany and Lizzie have been working on trying to model what happens when you start with a very twisted balloon with something rigid wrapped around it, and then inflate it with water the way that um, the cells inflate with water. I hope you're able to see this video and you see how it untwists as it inflates with water, just like the cells in the subrib untwist as they inflate. And then in beginning to try to model the entire rib, they have put two of these subribs together. Oops, let's turn off the sound. So here are two of these stretched out uh, straight. So this is like what the rib looks like when the flower is completely unfurled. And now we're letting it twist back into its bud shape. So this is sort of like doing backwards of what the plant is doing. And as each subrib individually twists, the whole thing also twists together. So this is a work in progress. We're just in the beginning phases here of trying to wrap around how this one tissue, the rib, can encode these two different kinds of motion, the twisting and the rolling. And I realize I've gone a little bit over, so I just wanna thank you so much for your time. And I, I hope that you can take away from this that plants uh, move, first of all, they're really cool. And there are things that we can learn from the way that they've evolved to very efficiently actuate motion, often by harnessing other sources of energy. So thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to take more questions. All right, thank you, Sharon. So we do have some questions. Um, is cucumber tendril behavior at all sensitive to light? Um, it is sensitive to light, but the coiling happens even in the dark. So, um, the overall like searching for something to grab onto, uh, the direction that that is centered around depends on where you put the light. Um, but I've taken videos with infrared cameras that the plant was less sensitive to that light and it still does the same coiling mechanism. And it's not just cucumbers, by the way, passion flower, pretty much all tendril bearing plants have this behavior. 
Great, thank you. Um, we have a pre-submitted question from earlier. Could the physics behind this be similar to what causes hair to curl? Yeah, I, I thought about that as well. Um, I have curly hair myself, and I've actually seen a uh, helix and a helical perversion and a helix of the other handedness in my own hair. And I have to admit, I pulled on it. <laughs> um, and it did actually do a little bit of overwinding. So I think that our hair, or at least mine, has a similar bending to twisting ratio, uh, stiffness ratio um, as, as the tendril. Um, but yeah, it's apparently it's different. Um, because it can spontaneously, you know, switch between, it's not clamped at one end, first of all. So it's, it's often you'll see the hair just forms a single helix rather than ever having a helical perversion. Um, and the helicity of it um, doesn't seem to be spontaneous the way it is with this rubber. So it seems that the way it comes out of, I don't know, what is that called? Basically the hair follicle directs it so that it's actually growing out already in this curled shape. So a little different from like the symmetry breaking of this mechanism. Great, thank you. So you actually answered our next question. Is the perversion totally spontaneous? Yep, it is. And it can, it can happen anywhere in the tendril or anywhere in, you know, one of these rubber strips. So if I just clamp a certain part of it, you know, it tends to be about in the middle, but not always. And um, if you get along enough one of these strips, you can actually have multiple perversions form in different places. So it's so spontaneous that, um, you know, it doesn't even have to always be in the middle. There, You could get multiple ones of them that can interact with one another. Very cool. Um, let's see. I think we still have some time. Um, are there examples of this twisting driven motion for plants that live at different size scales, like larger or smaller? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me think of what it's called. There is a, um, it's not actually a plant. It is a fungus. Ooh, I think it's called nitella. Um, so it's, so fun fungi and plants are different, um, but they do have some similarities in terms of the way that their cells grow and elongate and the way that their tissues work. Nitella is an organism that has a really similar kind of twisting that happens, but it's much, much smaller. You need to see it with a microscope scale. Um, and, you know, certainly DNA, which does overwinding, is another example of this, not just in animals. Um, but yeah, so I think there are lots of instances of this. And since our paper came out, it's been really interesting to watch the citations because they've ranged from, you know, plants, material science, uh, you know, uh, DNA studies, all kinds of situations where this arises. Great. Um, has anyone used your spring patent so far? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, I have a thought though, that it could be useful for something like earthquake stabilization, but I'm no engineer. <laughs> um, our next question, is this also how hop plants reach their heights? Yeah, I think those are also tendril bearing, as I recall. Yeah, hops do that as well. So I think, as I recall, they have shorter tendrils. Um, and there are some plants that um, like ivy, English ivy, when it grows, so it has like these little sticky pads that adhere to the wall that it's growing on. But often it's a sticky pad with like a little tendril thing attached to it, and then the plant. And that little tendril will still coil up to like pull it even closer. So yeah, I'm pretty sure it does happen in hops. I think I, I remember looking at one before when someone had suggested it. Wonderful. So for our last question, um, can you talk about how your early undergrad work in creative writing contributes to your current work? Um, well, you know, I think telling a story is a really important part of communicating scientific results. Um, and it can be so tempting to just do a dump of all the information that you have on a topic, maybe in chronological order of how you understood it. But the narrative arc um, of a scientific paper is so important. And I really 
think that I learned that from writing short stories. Um, so now I make sure it's not fiction, <laughs> but I think those skills have really translated over. That's wonderful. Well, Sharon, I want to thank you for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. Thank you to our audience for all your wonderful questions and for attending this event. We will follow up within the next week with a recorded video. Um, we hope you've enjoyed all of our mud talks. Um, we will have more this upcoming academic year. So if you are interested in being a speaker as a parent or an alum, please feel free to reach out to me and we will be able to set something up. All future events can be found on our website, alumni.hmc.edu. Have a great night, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you.